Well, uh, my name is Benoit Jos. I uh, am a, a Salesforce architect at Mar Labs, and we are a WSO2 partner, and we actually do a lot of solutions using Salesforce and WSO2. So Salesforce, as such, doesn't work in a, in a silo. It has a need to integrate with a, uh, with a lot of other systems. And that's where we bring in middleware solutions, especially WSO2, to integrate Salesforce and other systems. But today, I'm going to talk about how we use Salesforce and WSO2 Identity Server for single sign-on solutions into Salesforce. Uh, so before that, I want to just start about uh, why do we need SSO? So briefly, uh, we work in offices where we need access to multiple systems to get a work done. So could be you, you get into the uh, office, you log into your computer, use your Windows authentication, and then you want to file your expenses, you go to an expense application, you have a different ID for that. And then Salesforce, where the, you do all your sales forecasts and everything else, and that's a different ID. Typically, we use around six to 10 IDs in a day. And I don't know about you, but for me, it's a nightmare to, rem to remember these IDs and passwords. So there was a study done by a security company to understand the security posture of a company. And I want to tell about a few things that they found. First, one funny thing that they found is they looked at all the passwords being used in the systems. And do you know what is the most common password being used? Yes, that's right. <laughs> and the next one is one, two, three, four, five. And the next one is one, two, three, four, five, six. And then there's a bunch of dog names and cat names and so on. And that's what a typical password looks like. Um, so companies have kind of circumvented that or, or solved that problem by well, enforcing uh, password restrictions. It has to be eight characters to 10 characters or 14 characters. It has to be have a special character in place and so on and so on. And again, that's another painful thing. And the password expires every 25 days, 28 days, I mean, could vary. Now, there's another interesting thing that uh, I found one guy doing. So with this, this same policy of uh, having multiple passwords, uh, uh, different uh, uh, characters for a password, the password cannot be used more than four, like the last five passwords cannot be used. So what this guy did was pretty simple. Anytime he was forced to change the password, he would go in there, change the password five times, bring it back to the same old password, <laughs> and there you go. And here, there's one single password for all systems. So another significant thing as part of the study that they did was that how do people manage these passwords or this uh, different access to different systems? You know, what they found is that the most common way people remember that is using a post-it note. And you can find that, yes, and you can find that on the first drawer on the right. So you're a hacker, you walk into an office, you look at like empty office, you rummage through a few desks, go to the first I mean, and find one drawer that's open, and you have all the passwords that you need for that company. So how do you solve this? There is no easy solution to solve something like this. I mean, people are people, people will find easier ways to circumvent the system. So you, the only way we can do that is make the process a little easier, and that's where SSO comes in. So uh, briefly, in, uh, for people who are not familiar with SSO, all we're trying to do in SSO is that we're delegating this whole authentication process away from these individual systems into like one single system. So you have one, you set up, an, uh, set up one identity provider that has a trusted relationship with all the other systems, like be it Salesforce, your sales management system, or your expense management system, and so on. And as a user, you only need to know one ID, your Windows authentication in most cases. So when a user logs in, when a user tries to access a service, let's say Salesforce, he would go to Salesforce, Salesforce would know that SSO is enabled for this org. He would send it back to the identity provider, and if you're already logged in, the system knows that you're, you are an authorized user, it will log you into Salesforce seamlessly. And if you're not an authorized user, it will show you a, a familiar user ID and password prompt. You log in, once you're authenticated, you seamlessly log into Salesforce. And the same applies for any other system. Could be the next expense management system that you're working on. You're already logged in, you would be logged into that system and you get access to it. So that is, in, 
in brief what SSO is bringing in. Now, I want to talk about this particular business challenge that we, we faced in this. So we're talking about a company, about uh, 2,000 employees. All of them had uh, access to Salesforce. So they had this Windows authentication that they had to do, and plus they had this new set of IDs for Salesforce that they use. So obvious thing, can we combine these two? Can we do single sign-on? That's not the difficult part. The second part of this, this company had about 50,000 partners. Partners who had access to a partner portal, a custom application that's built out. And that's a very common scenario for a large company. So these partners log into the system. They do their business, like maybe upload inventory or manage inventory, invoices, and all that business stuff that they do, which is good. Now, what we did is we, next, we released the next generation of customer service for them. We had a very rudimentary kind of customer service based purely on email. So we want to go to the next level. Salesforce was the best option in there. Salesforce comes with an out-of-the-box customer service solution, like ticketing, case routing, and everything else built into it. And on top of that, Salesforce also has a customer service portal specifically for end customers. They can log into the system. They can actually open tickets. They can manage their tickets. They can even see tickets that have been opened previously, tickets from their, uh, uh, the same partner company, and only that, they also had access to a knowledge base where they could see articles that are relevant to what the, the business they do. And they had a Facebook, and uh, Salesforce has a Facebook kind of a collaboration tool called Chatter, wherein you can log in, you can actually interact with employees, you can employ, uh, interact with uh, other customers, other partners, like what common issues or common problems they're facing and so on. Fantastic, they loved it. The only problem, it had its own user ID and password. So that was the only reason why it did not go beyond the initial beta of like about 50 users. And they really wanted to expand that out and go out to all the 50,000 customers. But it was a no-go unless there was a single sign-on solution that would leverage the existing port of the, the portal system that they had. So uh, I mean, this is like a rough picture of how the technical challenge for us was we could build out different uh, single sign-on systems for each of these. But what we wanted to do was one comprehensive single sign-on solution. And the second challenge was like, we want to retain the existing partner portal authentication that they had, or the access that they had, and not force them to use another new ID and, and all the pain around it. The third one we were looking at is how to make this scalable. Right now, this is this very specific use case. But in the future, we're looking at how about mobile applications using OAuth. OAuth or other, uh, uh, other applications that would come and uh, other, other uh, partners or other customers would need access to the system. And we wanted a, a single sign-on solution that will kind of scale to the needs of the future. And one more thing we were looking at is how to do just-in-time provisioning. That was a critical thing for my partner onboarding process. And I'll get into it a little more later. How do we enable something like that? And the, and the onboarding process Unfortunately, most uh, uh, single sign-on solutions that they talk about, they all talk about just-in-time provisioning, but it's like a plain, simple thing. You just give me like three, uh, in, uh, three characters, sorry, three fields or something, and I'll enable it to you. But in reality, it's not that simple. There are like rules around it. There's some complex logic on how you onboard. I can't just onboard somebody by first name, last name, and email. I need a lot more than that to onboard a user. I, mean, I need to know whether he's valid. I, do, I need to know whether he's associated with an account and so on and so on. So that kind of flexibility, you do not get that with most single sign-on solutions. So, uh, this, uh, <coughs> so what, we want, what we did is that we built out the SSO framework in such a way that irrespective of uh, who is logging in, we have this one single system, we would know either from which service they're trying to hit, and decide how to route that authentication, and how to do just-in-time provisioning, and so on. So uh, again, a high-level picture of what So it's a partner or an employee who logs in. The, part the partners have access only to the Salesforce portal, and the employees have access to Salesforce and also to the Salesforce portal. Now, we need to decide based on who logged in and where they want to go. We need to decide how to authenticate them either against the Windows ADFS for employees or against a custom identity store for the partners. And we do that using a custom, I mean, 
custom framework written on top of WSO2 that would do this magic around it and then log the user in. <coughs> so typically, uh, when the user comes in, we, we know he's trying to access either the, which, which resource he's trying to access, either is accessing the Salesforce core platform or he's accessing the portal. So based on that, we have configuration set up. The, we can look, go look at the config file and figure out which authentication mechanism to use. So if they're going in for Salesforce, we know that we have to we use the built-in uh, authentication or built-in connector for ADFS, log, uh, authenticate them against it, and then authenticate, uh, sorry, uh, uh, get them to Salesforce. And if it's a partner, then we know that we need to go against the custom user store. And that's where we've got the flexibility of WSO2, which allows us to go against uh, Oracle database or any database by writing an adapter against it. So I, mean, I want to go about uh, why or what are the uh, reasons why we picked WSO2. So to begin with, we started off uh, the siloed approach, which is just that when we need to do single sign-on, let's just pick a good tool. So we evaluated OpenSSO. We looked at Shibboleth. Shibboleth was a fantastic tool to use. When, a little painful to uh, set up and configure, but once it is done, it's a fantastic tool. We did that, and we enabled single sign-on for all employees, and seamless Salesforce login, employees were great. Then next, we went into do the same using Shibboleth for partners, and we had to go against the custom data store, and that is when we actually ran into a lot of problems with, with Shibboleth. Shibboleth was not flexible enough for us to, like, take this custom, go against a custom data store, take this specific information in there and authenticate the user. It did not allow. We, we tried a lot of workarounds in it. We, we did a few stupid things too, and finally decided it was not worth it to actually go and uh, re, redo or like build a whole new module into Shibboleth just, to, just for this purpose. So then that is when we actually looked at WSO2. And the other good thing was that we were already using WSO2 ESB, sorry, data services server for some Salesforce interactions. So we kind of played very well with that. We tried to use WSO2. We looked at it, and we found this whole customization that we could do. So we could write our own class that would do the logic specific to the company, not depend on like some rigid format that Shibboleth or OpenSS or one of these uh, 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 the standard identity providers give us. So we could use that. and and get the login done. <clears throat> and the other uh, uh, great thing was the ability to do the just-in-time provisioning. So to give an idea about why the just-in-time provisioning was a little complicated is because we use Salesforce for all the sales processes. So we had an opportunity come through, and this is a partner who's trying to, uh, uh, who's an opportunity. We work through the whole process with them, do contracts and everything else in them, and then finally onboard. Now there's official onboarding from a system point of view. but at that time, the customer really doesn't, or the partner doesn't really have access to any of the systems. There is a whole other big process that has to go on the back end, some rules that need to be applied before they get access to the finance system, the other system, and so on and so on, and then finally to the portal. So from a just-in-time provisioning, what we wanted to do is reduce that time of onboarding for the customer. So even if the customer is not completely onboarded from a system's point of view, when they log in to open a ticket or even like go look at documentation, that's the first thing people want to look at. So as a partner, you want to come in there, you want to look at uh, collateral about, I mean, what, is that, what are the things I can do? What are the advantages I get by being on this platform or working with this company? Now, unfortunately, they were all in that uh, customer service portal. So we could still log them in by knowing that, so when the customer tries to log in, at least as part of the just-in-time provisioning, we can go back and look at Salesforce and know that this is not some random guy off the street who's trying to access our system. We, we know about this guy. We know his email. We know his uh, uh, phone number. And we can look it up and say, this is a valid guy, but unfortunately, is not onboarded yet. That's why he has no access to the system. So let's just give him access for now, some, tem some, some kind of temporary access till his whole system is set up. So that kind of made the customer service experience a lot better. Uh, before I summarize, I actually want to uh, talk about uh, how many of you Salesforce over here? Okay. So, <laughs> and there are a few people in here. So, I mean, I, I come from a Salesforce background, and, I'm, and Salesforce teams are not uh, uh, very flexible or rather uh, very welcoming to having 
enterprise ESB based solutions or like having a comprehensive solution to that. So next time when you go back to your team and talk to Salesforce, when I mean talk to the Salesforce team, I mean Salesforce provides a fantastic API. And uh, Usually the solution is like, why am I doing all this stuff? Let me just call the API. Let me do all I, all I want. I, why do I need an ESB? Why do I need a data services server? Why do you need an ETL in, in the first place? So I think it's a good conversation to go back and, and have with your team and say, like, yes, Salesforce does everything in there. This is the story of like, uh, just because there's a nail and I have a hammer, I, just need, I don't need to keep on hitting it. So have a comprehensive solution in place. So you, if you use, and let's say, pick a ESB tool or a, a, a solution like WSO2, you can get the advantage of use, using single sign-on, which is a fantastic thing that most companies need. And then you can use the data services server, and we use that for like, a lot of ETL jobs that we need to get done, push data from Salesforce to other systems and so on. And also use the ESB to expose some API. Even though Salesforce provides an API, it actually makes sense for you to have another layer of abstraction before it, so that you have control over how data is accessed and so on. So that's some conversation that you can, you can have with your team. To summarize, 80% uh, of the companies are going to Gartner would need SSO, and not even half of them are anywhere close to it, and mainly because they don't know how to go about it. They, have an, they know they have a need, and they kind of have an idea how to, uh, uh, of how to go do that. But they don't get into it because they don't know the full picture. And even if they get into it, they usually get into like uh, doing it as a, in a siloed uh, solution. Like, for example, the way we, we looked at it, and we looked at it only from a Salesforce point, point of view and nothing else. I mean, all I cared about, my business requirement was only Salesforce. I don't care about anything else. I just did single sign-on. But, uh, and we do shibboleth for that first, and then we move to something else. But we did have a conversation later with, with everybody else to see, I mean, this is one common solution, and it's not just Salesforce specific, we can use it for anything else. And we need to look at a more comprehensive strategy for single sign-on, and not just looking at it from a point of view of one system, but like multiple other systems that, uh, uh, that can use that, uh, use single sign-on. And another main thing is that you want to use something, uh, something of an open standard, like use SAML or uh, OAuth or OpenID. And the reason being, even in this place that I'm looking at, like there was already a solution using Oracle Identity Server, which which claims, and there are, there are many other many other uh, proprietary system which claim to be open standard, but they are literally in that small realm. And when you try to go outside of it and f and extend it, that is when you start getting into bigger issues. And when you want to implement your own business logic into it, that's when you fall into a lot more issues. So. Before, we, before you get into a single sign-on solution, I think look at it more holistically as to what kind of flexibility do you need. I mean, just doing AD authentication is not a single sign-on solution. You need a more comprehensive way of looking at it. You need to think about how to do just-in-time provisioning and what are your rules for just-in-time provisioning. As I said, giving a username, anybody on the street can give a username, and, sorry, a, a first name, last name, and an email is not your user. I mean, you need to have some rules around it. And, do you have a system that's flexible enough to handle that? And if you don't, you probably have to go back to the drawing board and like look at which is a system that works, for, works best for you. And in our case, I told us I mean, WSO2 kind of worked well. I mean, I'm sure you can evaluate that and see for yourself. But there are other solutions also available. Not that WSO2 is the only solution. But I mean, given the price and given the support and everything else, this kind of works for us well.